um, you know, we're hoping to push it as far as it can possibly be pushed. And I think we were told, more or less, by the Minister that if we did pull a coal hog, that he would overturn it, I believe. Um, I'm not sure if he has the power to do that. I think that's what he was suggesting. So I think this is, it looks like a good compromise. I'm just wondering, is it too much, you know, it's giving people, it says, we're reasonably practicable. So does that put, does that put the onus on them, or on, on the planning applicant, to, uh, to prove that, or to prove that it's not? Well, that's, that, that's, that, that wording is actually taken from uh, the statutory instrument, the part of the building regulations itself. So it's a, it's a language that the industry is very familiar with. Uh, and uh, the question, and Philip might have an idea, I don't know, in terms of, you know, if somebody applies, uh, in, the, in the context of the of down, uh, I, I'm, I might not be fair to voice this on this on you, but do you have an idea of, of, of you know, whether the onus would be then on the applicant to demonstrate to the local authority if they're doing something different, that it, that is what is reasonable? Philip, do you use that, sorry, just in terms of the, uh, yeah. Uh, Probably some sort of both. Parthead itself is actually based on uh, reducing CO2 and energy consumption insofar as is reasonably practical. That's actually the legal test. And then they go into Parthead technique guidance, which says, in order to meet that, for instance, you can do it by complying with the technical guidance document. So the technical guidance document isn't the only way of doing it. So uh, to some extent, if you offer to an assigned certifier or to the building, the local authority, evidence that you have met the test of going as far as it is being practical, uh, then it's up to them to bring you to court to say you have not complied with the building regulations because you have not gone as far as practical, you could have gone further. And they'd have to point to something in the uh, technical guidance document, probably, to say that they required you to do this and you didn't do it. But if your answer is, well, I've done something that's even better, uh, they would be kind of left without a counter argument. So I think you're reasonably safe. To some extent, you know, that, that statement that you must do it as far as a region factor is extremely vague from both directions. And um, so I have some sympathy for local authority because I think enforcing somebody who takes an alternative route to uh, the technical guidance document but has got some evidence to support it does leave the assigned certifier under the new control control amendment uh, regulations and leaves the local authority in somewhat of a dilemma. It would be hard for them to fight it, quite frankly, for those who are not quite know. But that, that route, by the way, Patricia, when it comes to non-domestic buildings, the route of not using, not using the technical guidance documents and using what they call an engineered solution is, is utterly uncontroversial. In fact, uh, some consultants will tell you that, that, you know, that, that they completely disregard, that it's normal to completely disregard the guidance documents. With dwellings, this is it's a bit newer uh, to, to, be, to be talking about this because, quite frankly, up before the new regulations came around, there was much more limited professional involvement in... Uh, in the design of dwellings. So, uh, but the point is, the, the assigned certifier, you know, uh, it's really up, up to them to, to satisfy themselves that whatever is being done uh, is, 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 is acceptable. There is a, an interesting question here from a building control point of view. I don't know what, this connect, what, what connection there is in the local authority between the building control and inspector and the founders in terms of dialogue. Um, but um, there's a, a really interesting argument that if you build a you build a passive house and you do it as a means of satisfying the regulations where you don't also have to meet the guidance documents, um, such as I mean, Paul's case, the solar array there, for instance, if you could reduce the solar side array to the size that the building actually needed, um, which is about a third of the size that you went for, um, there could be cost reduction. So you could find that, that you could make it cheaper to, you could make what you're down to proposing to do cheaper than just using the normal route. Does that answer, does that answer your, your, your query? Yeah. Did you have another part as well about um, uh, you know, the theory goes against what the, 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 the well, minister I mean, has? Well, in a way, that is so mitigated that I think and this mitigates it enough, I would imagine, that we managed to get, yes. get it through. Yes. Uh, I think, because you yes. can argue with people that they're capable And he has a process to follow. He has to, he has to um, you know, wait till the plan is finished. Uh, appoint an independent inspector and um, have a public consultation process then as part of that. I'll be finished in a second. Um, and, uh, you know, as one uh, councillor put it to me, um, he won't be the minister by the time that process is finished. 
Um, you know, there'll be a need on the... No, no, he may, he, may, he may get a position again, or he may be promoted, you know, um, but I'm saying that, in, in other words, there, there, there's likely to be change, so it's, there's a very plausible chance that um, uh, it might be, a, 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 you know, a, that he might not be in that position. <coughs> Sorry, so just to add to that, I think, yes. I, I think that, I think the Minister's problem is that the local authority that goes for the higher standard of the current building regulations is meeting the European requirements that the member states have. So it, it puts the minister in a very hard position to say, well, actually, you know, don't do what Brussels is telling you to do, go for a lower standard, because I'm not quite ready for it. So I don't think you can actually enforce it. It would be too embarrassing. Yeah. <coughs> very good point. Uh, yeah. Sorry, we, we've been asked to use the microphone because uh, councillors can't attend said that they look at the, at the video, so we're just trying to record what's been said. Sorry, Janet, that's true. No, it, it's just I had one little point. My name is Patrick Bazaar. Um, I've been involved in construction all my life. One thing that I've noticed with builders in general and the park, they obviously contradict this. We have to do this they, they simply don't understand most of it. And you can make, they're stuck with traditional cavity wall construction, which everybody is used to in this country. And yes, you can bring cavity wall construction up to passive standard, but it's an expensive way of doing it. There's lots of it. The way Paul is, has built that house there is using all traditional methods. Nothing very expensive in doing it. And it's a much simpler house to build. There's less, you know, you've no expensive components being used. It's, it's simple, old fashioned stuff has been used in that. And it's working on a hell of a lot, uh, a hell of a lot cheaper. As you said, the ventilation, I just put the passive house myself this year. Um, I moved in uh, early summer. I didn't have the price of that heat recovery when I moved in. Um, we were living in the house for about four weeks and I hadn't slept a proper night in, in the house. About four o'clock one morning, I woke up, I opened the window fully and I'm back to sleep. <laughs> and I slept. Um, and really, you know, you, I, because I had got all my detailing right and that's why I had everything right, but I just hadn't the price of the ventilation. And that is one of the major uh, points in it. So I think the big problem with building back, the big problem with builders is they're trying to make a rally car and they're starting with Morris Minor. Um, you, you know, the, the point that you make is you know, if you built to the passive house spec, it's with the point to put in the heat recovery and ventilation. Yes. When you did, the building worked. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And this is the point that, you know, it actually is a very exacting science. Yes. When you do go down to that low level, you're going to have all sorts of problems unless you have an overall design and, strategy. And, 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 and Paul both did uh, before they put in, before, before Patrick and Paul put in heat recovery, uh, although there are types of marginally margin better, what they essentially did was, was, was what the majority of the industry is doing now in terms of complying with building regulations. Um, you know, the, uh, highly insulated buildings with no ventilation strategy. A hole in the wall with a grill on top of it is it, it's, a, it's not a ventilation strategy. Um, there's no evidence. We cannot find evidence in monitoring studies and so on. And the, the Department of Communities and Local Government in the UK is doing monitoring studies um, at present. A, a big monitoring study for the season season follow up on a, an earlier study a couple of years ago, which demonstrated that they weren't working. And in fact, in one, the, the only study we found checked the condition of the vents before they began monitoring, 60% of the vents in, in 20 odd houses in this study were blocked. Um, because they create discomfort, people block them, um, and, uh, and then you get problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a question here. Uh, it's more of a comment. Um, the current house I live in, I'm signing a passive house, the current house I live in was built in 1974 with cavity block, and it has the vent in the wall in the bedroom, and we leave the window open absolutely in the ensuite. So I bought a carbon dioxide monitor just to get the feel for the thing. And the first night we had no wind or calm night. It alarmed at 3 a.m. at 2,000 parts per minute. So the, a hole in the wall and the window open couldn't keep us at a safe level. <coughs> Um, I'm David Hughes, um, Secretary of the Plastic Arts Association, but I just want to draw the Council's attention to two interesting points about Philip and um, Paul made. Um, one, first one, Paul, you often hear this expression of diminishing returns, and if you keep adding more and more insulation, doesn't it get to a point where you know, there's no point bothering anymore? What you actually see in the past past is a thing called compounding returns. <clears throat> where as you add more and more things, in fact, more and things start falling off your shopping list. So you actually start saving money. And I thought Paul illustrated that very well. Then Philip dealt with the overall cost or operational cost of the, of the house, whether you should factor that into its cost affordability. Now, 
the Chibi Bar has known and spends about 2,500 of energy, and the Pass House can get it down to 250. So that's a saving of 2,250, <coughs> which if you're on a pension, it's like a 20% boost in your pension. And if you're on the average industrial wage, it's over 10% on your take-home pay. I mean, this, without using a controversial subject, this is like reverse Irish water. This is just, you know, the gift that keeps on giving. And if any, if you want to see it, I actually did a discounted cash flow of the savings of 2,250 over a 30-year period at an 8% increase in energy. And I got that rate from the Department of Energy. And that has been a typical increase in electricity bills. Mm. And the actual total savings are 250,000 after 30 years. And that's after tax. So if it's before tax and you're at the margin rate, you've saved half a million. Mm. So, I mean, you know, it's... As I said to somebody, it's a comfort of the Mercedes with the running cost of the bicycle. We keep coming back to the Mercedes. I thought, sorry, I don't mention both of them. I don't mention both of them. Are there any questions the councillors have, or uh, I'm just conscious that um, this thing's career and tours as well? It's next week, it's the boat. Yeah. And is that right? The, the, um, it's the first item on the edition. I thought you'd maybe have a, have a talk about that. Yeah. yeah, well, we just got a doctor in the pack. I'm Mary Baker. Putting forward uh, Jeff's motion, and um, I put the first, uh, we got it in on the first lot round of this development plan mm. months ago now at this point in time. And I pretty much sold it to councillors at that time, having visited your wonderful house in that Mary. I was very taken with it, and taken with things like the air quality and, and, you know, the fact that you said you haven't been to the doctor forever and, you know, since you moved in and people haven't got sniffles and colds and, you know, I go home to my son who's asthma and I think, you know, yeah, maybe if we lived in a passive house, he mightn't have asthma. Well, my wife um, has asthma and yeah. my son has asthma and they haven't had an inhaler. Yeah, exactly. Years. Well, you see, that's, you know, and that's not just a saving too, you know, on energy costs, it's a saving on our, you know, national mm-hmm. health bill, etc., etc., and a better quality of life for everybody. And, and they're all so important. So we are about your 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 uh, work being run like a bike, and there's just so much more of this. But there's more and more layers to be uh, developed. And, and I say when we got to the first round, and, and I mean some of the councils had been to see the passive house. I pretty much sold it them on the basis of let's let's give this let this let us go out there, let us fly and see what what kind of reaction we get. And I think it's regrettable that certainly some people who gave a reaction that hadn't done their homework properly. Um, but you know, <coughs> I, I have previous history with previous ministries and um, development plans. I'm not prepared to back down this one just yet. Thank you. Um, because certainly you've, you've turned one no vote into a yes vote receiving. Well, thanks for saying this. Well, Kate, you know, and, and I really have to hand it to this man here, Jeff, who rang around each councillor. And they're near that down to invite them to come here and see whether they want to be My here. Parents are for evidence, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any other questions? questions? Sorry, is there, is there a question, question the panel? If, yeah, go on. Would your father go back to traditional building again after having built uh, that? Does he think that the, this passive post that he's built is more difficult or more tricky or you know a worse build than the buildings in the entire town? Uh, my father, as a carpenter, whenever he's explaining anything like this, he keeps going back to hanging the door, and the door hung right. <laughs> so, no, he, he won't, because he just sees this as the right way to do it, and you'd just be annoyed, because he, he takes a lot of pride. And he would have been kind of, he was sceptical about it himself as well. I, I think it's an educational thing, really, isn't it? He, he, he was sceptical about, you know, the, going to the foundation system and... Uh, and uh, Installation system originally, you were saying there in your presentation. Like so. Or very skeptical, but he's always had a real deep interest in work. And when he sees something, he thinks it's a, it's a good idea. And he sees it working well, he'll just go with it. That's it. And it says it all. Actually, the, the people you say about it, um, thank you the people for coming here, you're, you're dead right. Um, the board of the Classic House Association, I've never been on a board like it's a voluntary thing, but people just get it. And they're spending so much time and effort sort of saying, this just makes sense, we should just do this. And there's all sorts of lobby groups, and there's, you know, sort of big business uh, sort of resisting it. Um, and there's fear in, in, in industry as well in terms of quality, and God, we won't be able to do this. And, you know. But at the end of the day, I suppose, it is an education thing. 
and it would be wonderful if Lanira Dirk got the support and put this thing in because I think that it would really be a shining light you know, for, for the rest of the country. So, so this man here has, has something to say. This won't stretch down to you. Well, just to, to capture it on the, uh, on the video, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Councillor Shane O'Brien here with my colleague Councillor Chris Curran and uh, I just too want to thank Jeff, not just for the meeting tonight but for many conversations that we've had over the number of weeks. I supported Murray's initiative uh, back at the original County Development Plan, but not because I was fully sold on the idea, but because I believed it deserved a debate and it deserved a, a time and a space to, have, to allow that debate and that, that discussion to happen. Um, I suppose on the, on the department's uh, submission, um, I would take a very similar view to Jeff, and I think it's, it is flawed on many levels, and it seemed like a very rushed job that was put in on the last day of, of the allowable submission, and, and, it, and it reads that way, you know. Um, on terms of the current submission and this motion, that's, I just have a few questions in relation to that. Yeah, um, and, yeah. Just, and this is where I've seen some difficulties in terms of planning law and planning standards and regula- you know, re- differing regulations, especially when dealing with you know, inter-agencies or inter-department agencies, such as the Department of Education and Building a <coughs> School or things like that. And that's just the only question I have in terms of the wording, all new buildings. How will that apply when we, when we look at actually educational facilities or bigger institution, institutional facilities and what would be the cost effect of that? Because um, that's the, the one worry I, I still would have. Um, I'll give an example, you know, why, why, why am I even asking this question? There's a new uh, school uh, being proposed and, you know, to come ahead up in Slorin, but because of a uh, green roof strategy that was uh, roughly brought in as in the plan uh, par- par- L of the you know, planning standard and the energy um, that it's it's, it's actually the Department of, uh, sorry, Department of Education, uh, they were refused planning permission from the area right down. Instead of actually complying with the standards that a different department is setting, they appeal to the board. You know, we see an extended down period of time of getting that school built um, because the Department of Education is saying they don't have it in their budget, even though it should be in their budget because it's a standard that their colleagues in the, in the Department of Environment are saying. So it's that lack of joined up thinking yeah. that is my worry ar- around this. And I, I want to say, if we support it here in Dunleary, how can we sure, you know, be sure that it's integrated? And although we're trying to do something for, for the good, for a lot of the reasons that you've outlined, you know, lower uh, bills, more money in people's pockets to spend in the local economy, but how can we ensure that the, the jobs are all joined, you know? Well, actually, yeah, I can answer that. I can answer that. Um, just to touch up the way that Grass is running the very first, and it's, you know, the passive house standard works for all sorts of buildings. I mean, the very first supermarket passive house standard was built down for me, just built down for me. You know, buildings have been built to the passive house standard as well. Sorry, Jeff, you said Jeff. Well, just, uh, just on, on the schools, it's an interesting one. The Department uh, of Education has uh, a target um, that I believe it's committed to now for, it was originally for. Um, primary, and I think that they, they then decided after winning a Green Award a few years ago to commit to it for post-primary too, which is that all new school buildings must be built to an A rating standard. Um, so now they're trying to do that for very, very low costs, um, and actually you have hit an important issue because um, ventilation-wise there's a significant problem here. Um, the, the requirement for schools uh, is, uh, is manual opening of windows uh, in classrooms. Um, it's absurd. Absolutely absurd. It makes me very, very, very angry thinking about this because there's very accepted research in this in this field to show that, you know, Berkeley Laboratories, for instance, showed that by varying the carbon dioxide content in air in classrooms, you get a substan- even by, even moderate increases. So to sort of up, upwards of a thousand parts per million, you know, half of the level that uh, Willie mentioned there, um, uh, even at, at that level, you get a significant drop off in uh, in concentration. You know, we've all been there, a lot of us have been there as kids where you, you know, uh, a warm summer's day or whatever, where you fall asleep in, in class, you know. Um, and uh, this is a significant problem. When I, you know, I've raised this with the department for, with, with uh, the former minister, um, Rory Quinn, sort of indirectly, I raised specifically with a competition with an architect who was presenting a school uh, when the minister was in the room. And um, his response, he addressed it sort of indirectly um, in uh, his closing uh, uh, keynote, which is essentially, 
that we've just come out of the worst recession in our history and we don't have the budgets. You know, I, I just don't think that's good enough when you take it. It's, it's a marginal extra cost for, you know, but the, the, the issue is, is, is the fact that a, a functioning, a ventilation system will actually work, will require some degree of maintenance. Okay? And the schools, you know, uh, I don't think it's enough for us to just say, that, you know, if the department doesn't have the money, fine. You know, I, I don't think they should be allowed to get away with, uh, with, with energy efficient buildings. That are, because the other thing is that, um, you have energy efficiency campaigns going on in schools, and one of the first things they'll do is say, keep the windows shut. You know, it's just, it's, it's maddening. So it, 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 that has to be taken on. Um, did you want to say anything on that, in terms of just the, um, from the um, legal perspective, I suppose, of the going across um, the various different departments? Is there anything over that? Do you have to put you on the spot now? Well, there was a thing maybe it's kind of effectively, effectively tangential. I don't think you can create necessary coordination among the departments. It just doesn't happen very easily. Um, but um, if I was a, if I was a councillor or working in the local authorities and building uh, uh, doing construction, I would do what we did for the NDFA when we were building the uh, latest round of what they call the devolved schools. There's 18 schools built by the NDFA under design build concept. And we uh, suggested to the NDFA that when they are having the, how the schools designed and built, that the contractors bidding to win this would be partly evaluated on their predicted energy consumption of that school for the life of the school, and their, the uh, payment structure would also retain money so that after a period of commissioning where you can evaluate the energy consumption of the school, you would actually have them paid on that, as you like, like it affects liability period, but slightly longer. And really, every construction that anybody is doing should pin the constructor and the designer down to commit to what the energy consumption would be and actually reward them on that basis. Otherwise, there's no incentive for them to actually design permanently. That's sort of a slightly tangential issue, but it's just common sense. And the Commission, again, from Europe, from Brussels, in the Energy Services Directive, have said that all member states should be pushing this concept, and SCI have designed contracts to try and facilitate that. If I was a, if I was a, um, if I was a risk averse um, uh, person building, I just want to go with the standard. I know it works and just implement it. But it doesn't. It doesn't work. And that's no, no, the, the passive house standard. Well, so yeah, I, you know. know. <laughs> I, I stood at the Fred stand uh, earlier uh, this year, and everyone put their house plans. And I said, how are you going to work capital construction? It's capital construction. And you hear people talking about yeah. these whole in the shed, they're talking about posh prefabs. Some of these posh prefabs are a far superior build than the real houses we're going to build from in, in, yeah. in two years' time. Yeah. So there is quite a strong the concrete lobby. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. But you can still build the concrete. It's a separate concrete. I was um, a secondary school teacher for seven years. And one of the reasons I left and went into building was I couldn't take the quality of the building anymore, and especially coming from a building background. I remember on a really cold, cold winter's November day in the biggest girls' school in the country. And in the buildings we built in the 80s, big vaulted ceilings, loads of Felix, mm-hmm. big steel girders running directly from the outside to the inside up, and all the kids sitting there in big, big jackets and anoraks, freezing. And then you go into the building that was built in 2011, a massive, massive building. And Every window on a cold winter's day in that big building, every single classroom window was open all the way down and heat going flying out and all the kids struggling to stay awake. Sure. I just want to make a few points on the question on the school. I mean, first, uh, on an optimistic note, I mean, certainly the Department of uh, Education actually has pioneered in its uh, kind of technical department as an outstanding. They've actually done, I think, a primary school. So I, I would be kind of optimistic that you know the Department of Education at least will certainly get our message. But um, I think there's a few things. Just I, I certainly think one maybe pushback about the past health standard is whether it's a proprietary standard or you know it's and I think again if you go back to Paul's presentation if you can kind of see you can use the same materials but get a completely different results and I think the analogy might be cooking you know you, you're either a genius chef or else you probably a recipe book and the passive house gives people a recipe book but they can make the very simple decisions 
And I think you've got a couple of standards coming up, as Philip said, the 2018 requirement for NZ buildings. And also, I don't know how it applies to new builds, but for the public sector, we've got to achieve 33% saving in energy. We're meant to be one of the first. So I think a lot of these things are going to align very quickly, and they're going to be looking for the recipe book to see how to do this. And, you know, if they have any sense, take the one that's there, rather than having to reinvent the wheel. Um, I think some of the comments this evening have been really uh, appropriate because um, I, I don't think we're just talking about plastic house here, we're talking about building quality. That's it. If we want to build well from here on in, we have to go down the route of plastic house towards zero energy. Uh, you couldn't have an evening like this perhaps without mentioning uh, Longboat Key or all of the others. You just can't. Because what it was done on those sites was criminal, there was no coordination, there was no employment of professionals, and there was a building regulatory system that allowed poor standards. So if that's where you want to be a year from now or two years from now, that's fine and good. If it's not where you want to be, I think you're left as councillors with no choice but to vote for this. And you never get a perfect time to vote for it. You never get a perfect time for, every, for all the stars to be aligned that you can vote for this. In terms of, for years I've been asking myself the question, why don't government departments talk to each other? I mean, I'll be waiting until the end of time for government departments uh, to talk to, them, to themselves cogently. Uh, that's the first point I want to make. This is the time. We had an opportunity maybe seven or eight years ago, just at the beginning of the recession, to really get our construction industry reviewed and back into order. We didn't do anything. We probably had to get building regs back in the late 90s, uh, maybe the early 90s, when we could have really written good building regulations in the country. So times arrive when it is opportune to, to vote for something like this, and this is one such time. There, it just another couple of things. There are layers to this, uh, the, the mentioning of layers, because you know we've had a very good evening here about how to build homes, but obviously this a passive house is not just a house; it's, it's a building, so it applies to all buildings. So we we haven't even touched on the benefits of health. We've, we've just briefly mentioned them in terms of asthma, but the, the health benefits of this for your particularly vulnerable citizens in the area, old people, young people with medical problems. The, the benefits of them would be enormous, and the medical savings, the lack of uh, people going into outpatients and so on. Um, in, in money in pockets we've touched upon, and in percentage terms. If you could, if you could say to somebody, I can put five or 10% of your unemployment wage back into your pocket, you know, with, with, with very little effort, would that be a terribly foolish opportunity not to take up and try and implement? Um, export leadership. We have in Ireland, we, again, we've only touched on it this evening, we have people becoming export leaders internationally in this, both in the research and in the materials, and we should be supporting that. In other words, we have a department uh, led by Mr. Bruton, which one would, one would beg to ask, is he not promoting this? It is a real, real opportunity. And if we don't take this opportunity, some other country will take it. And then finally, the big the wonderful B car that we introduced a year ago. Passive House is B car. What B car was founded on, in my opinion, is Sorry, the I believe what B car is. Mark, Mark is Sorry, the building control. <laughs> building control amendment. Science certified. Uh, which is the Department of Environment. I mean, it's all about trying to control quality. And the same minister who has objected to doing this as part of the development plan is the same minister who proposed this and implemented it after Phil Hogan. And all it was, in effect, was paper. Lots and lots of paper. As a practicing architect, I would say to you, there's been huge resistance to it on building sites, and people don't take it on. But if you implement something like passive house, which is unequivocal, it can be measured, it, th there is no defense. There are no corners to hide behind. And when you have contractors like Pat Doran, who want to achieve a certain level of excellence on sites, <coughs> they should be supported. You won't have the likes of, uh, dare I say, developers stroke contractors who maintain they can put up 200, 300, 400 people in a development in town and say that I can build it to a standard that's acceptable. It, it can't be done without professional input, without the, the level of testing that Passive House has over 25 years. So sorry, I'll get off the soapbox. Can I ask one question of Philip? Please. One expression I've always been uh, slightly guarded by is this idea of cost optimization. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that cost optimization has always been a fig leaf that the Department of Environment has hid behind over the years, particularly in terms of their aspirations towards Part M 
Um, because it just strikes me, in terms of talking to economists, you, you can sort of shape any argument of cost of, of optimization to anything. I'm just wondering if you have a comment to make on that. Okay. Um, Should we wrap up soon after this? Just want to say, if people want to talk, absolutely. But I, just, I don't want to be taking five minutes of people's evening. But I'm conscious, in particular, how busy councillors are. Um, I, think that like, I don't think people are. Are there, 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 there any questions that you want to ask? Or you know, no, I don't ask. actually. I just want to say thanks to many for the insight. Because um, I served the of information. I feel like I have far more. Um, but um, no, just I just really just want to say thanks to me for going to the effort for this, like because it is very important in relation to the information that we have and how we're equipped to make decisions. Um, I am, yeah. Um, so that was really that was predominantly every, everything that I wanted to say, and uh, because I just started to head off. Okay, well, thanks a million. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, was there another council here as well? No. Yes. Is there anything you wanted to ask? No, or? Just a simple thing. Do they largely not have? Chimneys. I'm just interested in that. Chimneys, they don't. No. Because so what's what you, the problem? Well, you can have, you know, there was a very famous question asked at our conference there two years ago, exactly that question. Can you have, can you have a, a fire in a passive house? And of course you can. Yeah. Now you can't have an open fire, because think that the building is airtight and you're trying to make sure that there's, there's no drafts. So what you do is you pipe fresh air in under the stove and then take the exhaust out and it would go out through the, the chimney. It was the seal system. Just on that point, um, sorry, just want to get back to it. Very quickly. Yeah. Um, the, the same issue applies with building regulations. The nine examples that the department came up with of different house types to, uh, to, to make them comply in it and the lowest common denominator way with building regulations that, that Paul was comparing against, not one of them had a chimney. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a quick win. Um, we did feature a passive house in the magazine a while ago, a couple of semi ds um, and the client was an interior designer, um, and she built a dummy fireplace, um, so that the room would have a focal point. So, I mean, that may not satisfy everyone, but of course, yeah, there are sealed stoves, so if you want a flame to look at, you know, there are room sealed stoves which have the efficiency. The problem with an open fire is it's 30% you know, efficient when it's in use, and it's like minus 100% efficient when it's not. Um, so, if you can, there are, you know, there are ways of around it, but open fires, that's not a passive house issue, that's a building regulations issue. There have been, it's, it's almost impossible to include them in the homes. Sorry, and uh, I just want to get back to Philip now, who has the perfect answer I do. to Martin's question on cost optimization. Uh, yeah, cost optimization comes from the Energy Performance Directive of 2010, and it's quite clearly defined. It says cost optimal level means the energy performance level which leads to the lowest cost during the estimated economic life cycle, where the lowest cost is determined taking into account energy related investment costs, maintenance and operating costs, including energy costs and savings, uh, where applicable, and disposal costs where applicable. And the estimated economic life cycle is determined by each member state. It refers to the remaining estimated economic life cycle of a building where energy performance requirements are set for the building as a whole. So, in other words, for houses it's 30 years, for commercial buildings it's 25 years. And the Commission have a really complicated mathematical formula which is then applied to each member state's standard houses to see whether we have met the test. I can give a copy, I've got five spare copies of the summary done by ACOM, or ACOM uh, of our uh, cost optimization. It goes into detail about the whole uh, use of photovoltaics, use of gas boilers, use of insulation. So it's a very defined uh, product uh, coming from the Commission's methodology, and the methodology is a detailed annex. So there's nothing they can hide under at all. Um, and they may be throwing cost optimization, cost optimization, cost benefits out at you loosely, but in fact it's well defined and it has been examined by AECOM, paid for by the department, uh, and the SA for the non dwellings they've been found to be miles off, of course. Very good. Thank you, Philip. And it really does beg the question if you look at Paul Horn's house, where there's a mm-hmm. cost optimization there. If you went to the passively save money building it, and of course they're more to be Look, we're, we're, at, we're pretty much out of time. Maybe just a, Two comments from the panel, and then if there is anything, because you know we really are dependent on the councillors um, to, to you know do the right thing on behalf of the constituents. And please God, you've got an insight here, so let us know if there's anything that we can do to, to help you beyond this. Um, just two two quick comments. Uh, just back to the fire. Uh, in all the houses that we could see coming in the price, and all the houses we've done, only one didn't want to fire. Every one of them wants a fire because that's a really good point. It's a brilliant focal point. 
difference is it, the, it's one one chin rather than two. The one in the big, especially if there's an area, a big open plan, kitchen, living area with lots of glass, works really well. It doesn't work too well in the front TV room that's small, small. because it'll just blow you out. But it, it's a good point, but it'd be a focal point. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Paul has said so many things, I just want to say, I'm just to answer that lady's question. We, we've done a house in Ross Lair, uh, and where we were in a cassette type fire, wood burning stove, uh, fully certified passive and airtight, and fed the draft from underneath. <coughs> and the whole reason it was put in was because the idea I had was that the Irish people like a fire, they like a focal point in the room, but uh, in that house the fire is there. And as Paul said, the problem with it is when you light it, the whole house becomes too warm. <laughs> There's no fire in my house. It's, it's a quality problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, it was on the shoulder roar program when Pat, uh, or in Tom Harlan, uh, said about the Mercedes and the even photovoltaics and everything. I found myself two days later with Chairman of the Passive House Association on the shoulder roar program uh, and uh, saying, you know, what the, what the facts were. I've got, I've got a PhD in pa- application of Passive House of the Irish Climate. Uh, well, what one question did he ask? Just one other thing. Yeah. There's a concept out there in, in the general public that in, in the general world that you cannot open a window in a passive house. You can. That's what windows you open it up on them for. You can open a window in a passive house. If it gets all warm, you open the doors, you open the windows. Same as a normal house. Same as a They are a normal house. They are a normal house. Yeah. Are there any questions from the council just before we finish? No, uh, I know this one's keen to get in the right. I just want to say one thing, because actually a few things that this man here said about David and Philip as well in terms of the legal uh, position. Uh, I'm an architect in McGogarty, and you know, as practitioners, we deal with planning authorities and fire authorities all through our you know working lives. Um, Jeff said something. Um, in relation to what our statutory obligations are under the building regulations, you know, and you spoke um, particularly about you know alternative solutions to the technical guidance document and engineering solutions, and I'd say that, that in particular refers to fire. It's one area that you know we deal with that on a regular basis, and we have the comfort of making an application to the fire authority and having our designs certified back to us. That's very, very important. Yeah. But we do have a statutory, it's a national statutory requirement to measure the performance of our buildings in the deep techno, in the deep methodology. Yeah. And I just have to add it just a little note of caution. Admirable as it is to demand a passive standard that, um, you know, what Pat was saying there, you know, the U-values are there, the U-values of the walls. The one thing that's missing is the air types. That's probably the big thing that makes the leap in terms of the recipe of, of stuff. But I think we could get into a little bit of a mess, you know, in terms of how the standard is to be applied to practitioners as we apply for planning permissions. You know, I notice that there's nobody here from the planning authorities or whatever. That, that's instruction from the local authority. Um, so they they use it. Sorry. There's so, one that was pointed to me. Yeah, sorry, yes, sorry. yeah. Judge response. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, I'll get back to you. Um, the response from, from the officials was that because it's a statutory process with the development plan, um, it wouldn't be appropriate for them to attend this meeting again. Oh, no, but that's, that's sorry. Yeah. Yeah. not quite what I'm saying. Sorry, I'm saying yeah. that, there is a, that there is a statutory obligation on our part yeah. when we design okay. to design a house using the deep. And I, I, think, I completely agree with you on that as well. And that's statutory, yeah. that's not a technical guidance, yeah. that's yeah. a statutory requirement. Yeah. It's like, you know, has any thought been put into it? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. And Philip actually um, has, has spoken on this, well, we've spoken about it before, but I mean, uh, and Brian Motherway, the head of the Sustainable Energy of Ireland, who mm-hmm. um, run that, that, that software, of course, or responsible for it, uh, agrees, and he ran this by the building standards section in the Department of Environment, that you do have to do deep calculations, we agree with that completely, uh, to comply with regulations. But, that, but, but he's also on record in our magazine saying that you don't have to get a particular outcome in deep to combine with part L. Um, 
It'll tell you whether you need conformance, and he says there's a difference between conformance and compliance, and that conformance is, is an easy way to meet compliance. That's what Brian Miller said. Just adding that it can be more complicated than that, but sometimes we can go back to the recipe here, that a passive house can give you a worse result. That's true. That's, 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 that's true. That's, 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 you're right, and, and the question now, what, there is a question of the building and drawing target to consider there. They, they could, of course, just say, well, you, you meet the same targets in, in deep as well, because they're, you know, uh, because you, you do have to meet the building regulations. Whether you have to meet the guidance documents is, is another matter. Um, but they could take the line that you have to do that. And Paul's house, for instance, and Michael Bennett's house, both of those low cost houses do those things as well. Okay? Um, so, um, but it is also arguable that you want to push it to be more provocative, uh, as probably the design uh, by my inner teenager wants to do um, uh, that, that you know we've seen some building control in our students actually say like it's a passive house so therefore you don't need to take every box um, in, in, uh, and in fact Brian Motherway uh, has also on record saying that they will consider changing the wording indeed to more correctly reflect the requirement in the regulation and so in other words to say that you don't necessarily need, need to hit targets indeed to comply but who, who, will, who will say that because there is no building control authority that you ask to certify a passive house without We actually have a legal expert now in the room. Spirit, you can say that. No, we do. I think you're wrong. That's a good question. What's, what, what makes you say you will leave the statutory obligation to design according to deep or using deep? To, to measure your performance according to deep. Because that's, Where does that come from? That's in the second in part schedule of, of part of the 3A says. Uh, and it's, quoted, it's quoted in technical guidance. Yeah, but it doesn't quite say that. The, the, the part L1, if you look generally at part the, L, L3, yeah, but uh, if you look at the part L is different from all of the parts of the building regulations. If you look at part A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, they lay out in A, A1, A2, A3, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. Mm -hmm. L is different. L shalt, set, does say L1, thou shalt, and the shall, according to the Lord, is that you shall um, build to minimize CO2 emissions and energy use insofar as is reasonably practical. That is the thou shalt. After that, L2 is the shalt, shall be met by, which means may be met by, because it's quite clear from uh, the technical guidance, and I think even from this, that this is not necessarily, according to matter, as a matter of law, the only way of meeting the thou shalt to do it as far as it is reasonably practical. So I think you're wrong to say, but I can understand that people are saying that because it's an easy default, that you must do it by uh, using D. What does, what does part L3 say? Part L3 starts off, for new dwellings, the requirement shall be met by. Mm -hmm. So that is, the requirement is L1. And one way of meeting L1 is by L3A and L3B, and also by the technical guidance documents. So, so, the only, uh, so it's L1 is actually is the, is the standard. And, you know, sorry, excuse me, Philip. No, I understand what you're saying, but I spent a lot of time thinking yes. about this. It is, the wording is, is unclear, um, but I think I'm correct in saying that. Well, we can hardly get this. I took your point. Yeah. But look, look, look at A, B, C, D, E, F. Look at all the, look at the building regulations in a whole, and you find that it's all the same. You've got part B, 1, B, 2, B, 3. Yeah. And they all have the same wording. You shall do this, you shall do this, you shall do this. Suddenly come to L, L2 and 3, which is that L1, which is standard, is met by. So I'm not sure that a court will say that you must use D. Mm. Sorry, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting point for coming. Maybe right just wrap it up there. Just a quick rider, David. Is it a quick rider, David? Well, first of all, I don't think deep and the past paths are mutually exclusive. Deep is an asset rating. It's not a performance rating. And deep only considers heating the house for eight hours a day, whereas a passive house will only lose half a degree Celsius per day, even if there's no heating on it. So effectively, you're looking at a 24-hour cycle. So it's one third the energy of deep. So I think you can easily do your deep calculation, and then you can go on to do your passive house, which includes energy, which includes cooking energy, appliances that are plugged in that deep doesn't count, and more of a 24-hour heating cycle. And if you're trying to predict how your building will perform for your client, I know which one I'd prefer to be. Job. But in purely in terms of a box ticking exercise, you can do the deep, yes, but you're confident as well. Yeah. And I mean, you know, so this, you know, we haven't invented this uh, issue here. 
And in Brussels as well, they then implemented passive career issues in terms of what the building regulations say, what does passive say. And I mean, Niles has, has built the building regulations and built to the passive health standard. Uh, and so it can be done. There will be finer points which need to be ironed out, but I suppose they can be ironed out. If, if we get anything in terms of the experience of other countries that have gone ahead and done it. May I thank our speakers uh, for this evening in the, in the usual way. Uh, Paul gave an excellent uh, overview from the nuts and bolts of building a passive house and, and through to the costs. Uh, Philip, you know, you gave a, it was fantastic to have you here as well, just as, as a expert, because often we're in trouble when it comes to such questions. And Michael, again, from the perspective of just building a house that would be a fantastic model for a social housing house. Uh, thanks again.